Chapter 26. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root, and the bud of the bud. And the sky of the sky of a tree called life. Which grows. Higher than the soul can hope, or mind can hide. And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I carry your heart, I carry it in my heart. From I carry your heart with me I carry it in, a poem by E. E. Cummings Band, listed in the Comprehensive Compilation of Dangerous Words and Ideas www.ccv.gov.org. When I wake up again it's because someone is repeating my name. As I struggle into consciousness I see wisps of blonde hair, like a halo, and for a confused moment think maybe I've died. Maybe the scientists were wrong and heaven isn't just for the cured. Then Hannah's features sharpen, and I realize she's leaning over me. Are you awake? She's saying. Can you hear me? I groan, and she sits back a little exhaling. Thank God, she says. She's keeping her voice to a whisper, and she looks frightened. You are so still I got for a minute that you that they she breaks off. How do you feel? Shitty, I croak loudly, and Hannah winces and looks over her shoulder. I notice a shadow flitting just outside the bedroom door. Of course. Her visit is being monitored. Either that, or someone is on 24-7's guard duty. Probably both. My headache is slightly better, at least, although now there's a searing pain in both of my shoulders. I'm still pretty groggy, and I try to adjust my position before remembering Carol and Rachel, and the nylon cord and realizing that both of my arms are stretched above my head and secured to the headboard, like a real honest-to-God prisoner. The anger comes again, waves of it, followed by panic as I remember what Carol said, my procedure has been moved to Sunday morning. I swivel my head to one side. Sunlight is streaming in through the thin plastic blinds, which have been drawn down over the windows lighting up dust motes in the room. What time is it? I struggle to sit up and yelp as the cords bite farther into my wrists. What day is it? SHHH. Hannah presses me back against the bed, holding me there as I squirm underneath her. It's Saturday. Three o'clock. You don't understand. Every word grates against my throat. They're taking me to the labs tomorrow. They moved my procedure. I know. I heard. Hannah is staring at me intently, like she's trying to communicate something important. I came as soon as I could. Even the brief struggle has left me exhausted. I sink back against the pillows. My left arm has gone totally numb from being elevated all night and the numbness seeps through me, turning my insides to ice. Hopeless. The whole thing is hopeless. I've lost Alex forever. How did you hear? I ask Hannah. Everyone's talking about it. She gets up goes to her bag and rummages around before pulling out a water bottle. Then she comes back and kneels by the bed so we're eye to eye. Drink this, she says. It will make you feel better. She has to hold the bottle to my lips like I'm an infant. Kind of embarrassing, but I'm long past caring. The water kills some of the fire in my throat. She's right. It does make me feel slightly better. Do people know? Are they saying? I lick my lips and shoot a glance over Hannah's shoulder. The shadow is there. As it shifts, I make out the flicker of a candy-striped apron. I drop my voice to a whisper. Are they saying who? Hannah says, overly loud don't be stubborn Lena. They'll find out who infected you sooner or later. You might as well just tell us who it was now. This little speech is for Carol's benefit obviously. As she speaks Hannah gives me a little wink and a minute shake of her head. So Alex is safe. Maybe there's hope after all. I mouth to Hannah Alex. Then I jut my chin at her, hoping she'll understand that I want her to go find him, and tell him what happened. Her eyes flicker, and the little smile dies from her lips. I can tell she's about to give me bad news. Still enunciating her words loudly and clearly, she says, it's not just stubborn Lena. It's selfish. If you tell them, maybe they'll realize I had nothing to do with it. I don't like being babysat 24-7. My heart sinks, of course they've put a tail on Hannah. They must suspect her of being involved in some way, or at least of having information. Maybe it's selfish, but at that moment I can't even feel sorry for her, or for the trouble I've caused. I can only feel bitterly disappointed. There's no way for her to get word to Alex without bringing the whole Portland police force down on his head. And if they find out he's been masquerading as a cured, and helping the resistance? Well, I doubt they'd bother with a trial. They'd skip straight to the execution. Hannah must read the despair on my face. I'm sorry Lena she says this time in a whisper. You know I would help if I could. Yeah. Well, you can't as soon as the words are out of my mouth, I regret them. Hannah looks terrible almost as bad as I feel. Her eyes are puffy and her nose is red, like she's recently been crying, and it's obvious she really did rush here as soon as she heard. She's wearing her running shoes a pleated skirt, 
and the oversized tank top she usually sleeps in as though she got dressed in the first items of clothing she pulled off her floor. I'm sorry, I say, less sharply. You know I didn't mean that. That's okay. She moves off the bed and starts pacing, like she always does when she's thinking. For one second one tiny fraction of a second I almost wish I had never met Alex at all. I wish I could rewind back to the very beginning of the summer, when everything was so clear and simple and easy. Or rewind even further to the late fall when Hannah and I did our loops around the governor and studied for calculus exams on the floor of her room and the days clicked forward toward my procedure like dominoes falling in a line. The governor. Where Alex first saw me. Where he left a note for me. And then just like that, I have an idea. I struggle to keep my voice casual. So what happened to Alison Davini? I say. She didn't want to say goodbye. Hannah whips around to stare at me. Alison Davini was always our code, our name for Alex whenever we needed to talk about him on the phone or in emails. She draws her eyebrows together. I haven't been able to get in touch with her, she says carefully. The look on her face says I explained this to you already. I raise my eyebrows at her like, trust me. It would be nice to see her before the procedure tomorrow. I hope Carol is listening and takes this as a sign that I've resigned myself to the change in plans. Things will be different after the cure. Hannah shrugs, spreads her arms. What do you want me to do? I heave a sigh and seemingly switch topics. Do you remember Mr. Raider's class? In fifth grade. How we used to pass notes back and forth, all day. Yeah, Hannah says warily. She still looks confused. I can tell she's beginning to worry that the bump on my head has affected my ability to think clearly. I sigh again, exaggeratedly, like just reliving all the good times we had together is making me nostalgic. Do you remember how he caught us and made us sit across the room from each other? So every time we wanted to say something to each other we would get up and sharpen our pencils and leave a little note in that empty flower pot in the back of the class. I force a laugh. One day I must have sharpened my pencil 17 times. And he never caught on not once. A little light goes on in Hannah's eyes, and she grows very still and super alert, the way that deer do when they are listening for predators, right before bolting even as she laughs and says, yeah, I remember. Poor Mr. Raider. So clueless. Despite her offhanded tone, Hannah lowers herself onto Grace's bed, leaning forward with her elbows on her knees, and staring at me intently. And now I know she knows what I'm really telling her while I'm rambling about Alison Davini and Mr. Raider's class, she needs to get a note to Alex. I switch topics again. And do you remember the first time we ever did a long run? Afterward my legs were like jelly. And the first time we ever ran from West End to the governor. And I jumped up and slapped his hand like I was giving him a high five. Hannah narrows her eyes at me ever so slightly. We've been abusing him for years, she says carefully, and I know she doesn't quite get it not yet. I make sure to keep all tension and excitement out of my voice. You know, someone told me that he used to be carrying something. The governor, I mean a torch or a scroll or something. Now he just has that little empty space in his fist. That's it. I've said it. Hannah inhales sharply and I know now she understands, but just to make sure I say will you do me a favor. Will you do that run for me today? One last time. Don't be melodramatic, Lena. The cure works on your brain, not your legs. You'll still be able to run after tomorrow. Hannah answers flippantly, just the way she should, but she's smiling now and nodding at me. Yes. I'll do it and I'll hide the note there. Hope pulses through me, a warm glow, burning off some of the pain. Yeah, but it will be different, I whine. Carol's face flashes momentarily at the door, which is open just a crack. She looks satisfied. It must seem to her like I've come to terms with having the procedure after all. Besides, something could go wrong. It won't go wrong. Hannah stands up and stares at me for a moment. I promise, she says slowly giving each word weight, that everything will go perfectly. My heart skips a beat. This time she was giving me a message, and I know she wasn't talking about the procedure. I should get out of here, she says, moving to the door practically skipping now. I realize that if this works if Hannah does somehow manage to transmit a message to Alex, and if he somehow manages to break me out of my house turned prison cell this really will be the last time I ever see Hannah. Wait, I call out when she's almost at the door. What? She whips around. Her eyes are shining. She's excited now, ready to go. For a moment standing in the fuzzy haze of sunlight still penetrating the blinds, she appears to be glowing, as though lit up by some internal flame. And now I know why they invented words for love, why they had to it's the only thing that can come close to describing what I feel in that moment the baffling mixture of pain and pleasure and fear and joy all running sharply through me at once. What's wrong? Hannah repeats impatiently, jogging a little in place. I know she's eager to get going and put the plan into action. 
I love you, I think, but what I say, gasping a little is have a good run. Oh, I will, she says, and then just like that, she's gone. Chapter 27 He who leaps for the sky may fall, it's true. But he may also fly. Ancient saying provenance unknown listed in the comprehensive compilation of dangerous words and ideas www.ccb.gov.org. I've known time to stretch out like rings, expanding outward over water. I've also known it to rush by with such force it leaves me dizzy. But until today, I've never known it to do both at the same time. The minutes seem to swell around me, to stifle me with their sluggishness. I watch the light move by centimeters over the ceiling. I fight the pain in my head and my shoulder blades. The numbness radiates from my left arm to my right. A fly circles the room, buzzing up against the blinds over and over, trying to fight its way outside. Eventually it drops from the air, exhausted, hitting the floor with a tiny pinging sound. Sorry, buddy. I sympathize. At the same time, I'm terrified when I see how many hours have gone by since Hannah's visit. Every hour brings me closer to the procedure, closer to leaving Alex, and even as each minute seems to take an hour, each hour seems to fly by in a minute. I wish I had some way of knowing whether Hannah successfully hid a note at the governor. Even if she did, there's only the barest hope that Alex will think of looking there for word from me the skinniest hope, the edge of an edge. But still hope. I haven't even thought about the other obstacles that stand in the way of my escape like the fact that I'm strung up like a salami, or the fact that either Carol or Uncle William or Rachel or Jenny is always stationed just outside the door. Call it denial or stubbornness or craziness, but I just have to believe that Alex will come and rescue me like in one of the fairy tales he told me about on our walk back from the wilds where the prince springs a princess from a lock tower, slaying dragons and fighting forests of poisonous thorns just to get to her. In the late afternoon Rachel comes in with a bowl of steaming soup. She sits down on my bed wordlessly. More Advil. I ask her sarcastically as she offers me a spoonful. You feel better now that you've slept, don't you? She returns. I'd feel better, if I weren't tied up. It's for your own good, she says, making another gesture to my mouth with the spoon. The last thing I want to do is accept food from Rachel, but if Alex does come for me when? When he comes for me. I have to keep believing, I'll need to have my strength up. Besides, maybe if Carol and Rachel really believe that I've given up on the idea of resisting they'll loosen up my restraints or stop standing watch outside the bedroom door, giving me the opportunity to escape. So I take a long slurp of soup, force a tight smile, and say, not bad. Rachel beams at me. You can have as much as you want, she says. You need to be in good shape for tomorrow. Amen sister, I think and drain the whole bowl before asking for seconds. More minutes, a slow drag, like a weight pulling me under. But then suddenly, the light in the bedroom turns the warm color of honey, and then the trembling yellow of fresh cream, and then begin swirling away from the walls altogether, like water going down a drain. I haven't really expected Alex to show up before night that would be suicide but pain grabs deep in my chest anyway. There's almost no time left. Dinner is more soup, topped with soggy chunks of bread. This time it's Carol who brings the meal to me while Rachel stands outside. Carol unties my hands briefly after I beg her to let me use the bathroom, but she insists on accompanying me to the toilet and standing there while I pee which is more than humiliating. My legs are unsteady and the pain in my head worsens when I stand. There are deep grooves in my wrists the nylon cord has left its mark and my arms are like two dead weights swinging lifelessly from my shoulders. When Carol goes to restrain me again I consider resisting even though she's taller than I am, I'm definitely stronger but think better of it. The house is full of people, my uncle included, and for all I know there are still some regulators hanging out downstairs. They have me secured and sedated within minutes, and I can't afford to be put under again. I have to be awake and alert tonight. If Alex doesn't come I'll need to generate a plan of my own. One thing is certain, I won't have the procedure tomorrow. I'd rather die. Instead I concentrate on tensing my muscles as hard as I can while Carol ties me up. When I relax again there's a tiny bit of wiggle room just a fraction of an inch. Maybe enough to give me the chance to work my way out of my makeshift handcuffs. More good news as the day has worn on everyone has gotten a little more lax about guarding the bedroom constantly, just as I'd hoped. Rachel abandons her shift for five minutes to go to the bathroom. Jenny spends most of the time lecturing Grace about the rules to some game she has invented. Carol leaves her post for half an hour when she goes to do the dishes. After dinner, Uncle William takes over. I'm glad of it. He has a little portable radio with him. I hope he'll nod off the way he usually does after eating. And then maybe just maybe I'll be able to bust out of here. By nine o'clock all the light in the room has swirled away and I'm left in darkness, shadows draped like fabric over the walls. The moon is large and bright, coming through the blinds and barely outlining everything in a hazy silver glow. Uncle William is still outside, listening to the radio on low, an indecipherable static. 
Noises float up through the floor, water rushing in the kitchen and downstairs bathroom, voices murmuring downstairs, and the scuffling of padded feet, the final coughs and shakes before the house will fall silent for the night, like a person in the middle of death grows. Jenny and Grace still aren't allowed to sleep in the room with me. I assume they're all settling down to sleep in the living room. Rachel comes in one last time, carrying a glass of water. It's difficult to tell in the darkness, but it looks suspiciously cloudy, like someone has dissolved something in it. I'm not thirsty, I say. Just a few sips. Seriously, Rachel. I'm not thirsty. Don't be difficult, Lena. She sits down on the bed and forces the water to my lips. You've been so good all day. I have no choice but to take a few mouthfuls tasting as I do, the acrid sting of medication. Definitely laced with something more sleeping pills, no doubt. I hold the water in my mouth refusing to swallow, and as soon as she stands and turns back to the door I turn my head and let the water run out onto my pillow, into my hair. It's kind of gross, but better than the alternative. Wetness seeps into my pillow, temporarily cooling the sting of pain in my shoulders. Rachel hesitates at the door as though she's trying to think of something meaningful to say. But all she comes up with is, see you in the morning. Not if I can help it, I think, but I don't say anything. Then she leaves me, closing the door behind her. And then I'm left in total darkness, with just the passing of the hours, the minutes ticking forward. And as I lie there with nothing to do but think as the house settles and goes silent around me the fear returns, a terrible fog. I tell myself he must come he has to but the clock creeps forward, taunting me, and outside the streets are silent except for the occasional barking of a dog. To keep my mind from cycling endlessly around the same question, will Alex come, or won't he? I try to think of all the ways to kill myself on the way to the labs. If there's any commercial traffic at all on Congress, I throw myself in front of one of the trucks. Or maybe I can make a break for the docks. It shouldn't be too difficult to drown, especially if my hands are still tied. If worse comes to worst I can try to fight my way to the roof of the labs like that girl did all those years ago, dropping out of the sky like a stone cleaving the clouds. I think of the image that was beamed onto televisions everywhere that day, the small trickle of blood the strange expression of restfulness on her face. Now I understand. It sounds sick, but generating these plans actually makes me feel better, beats back the terrible flutterings of anxiety and fear inside of me. I'd rather die on my own terms than live on theirs. I'd rather die loving Alex than live without him. Please, God, make him come for me. I'll never ask for anything again. I'll give up anything and everything I have. Just please make him come. At midnight the fear turns suddenly to desperation. If he's not coming, I'll have to get out of here myself. I work my hands in their restraints, trying to leverage that extra centimeter of space. The cord cuts deeply into my skin, and I have to bite my lip to keep from crying out in the dark. No matter how I pull and tug and twist, the cord refuses to relax any further. But still I keep trying, until sweat is dripping down along my hairline and I'm worried that if I crash any harder it will attract someone into the room. Something wet trickles down along my forearm, and when I crane my head backward I see a thick, dark line of blood streaking my skin, like an awful black snake, all my struggling has caused my skin to chafe away. Outside, the streets are as quiet as they've ever been, and in that moment I know that it's hopeless, I won't be able to escape on my own. Tomorrow I'll wake up and my aunt and Rachel and the regulators will escort me downtown, and the only chance of escape I'll have will be into the ocean, or off the roof of the laboratories. I think of Alex's molten honey eyes and the softness of his touch and sleeping under a canopy of stars, stretched out above our heads like they were placed there just for us. Now, after so many years, I understand what the coldness was and where it came from this sense that everything is lost and worthless and meaningless. Finally, the cold and the despair turn merciful, dropping down on my mind like a dark veil, and miracle of miracles, I sleep. I wake sometime later in ink-purple darkness with the sensation of someone in the room some loosening of the restraints on my wrists. For a second my heart soars and I think, Alex, but then I look up and see Gracie, perched at the head of my bed working at the cords binding me to the headboard. She is pulling and untwisting and bending forward, occasionally to chew at the nylon with her teeth giving the impression of a quiet and industrious animal gnawing its way through a fence. Just like that the cord snaps, and I'm free. The pain in my shoulders is agonizing. My arms are full of a thousand pinpricks. But still, in that moment of release, I could shout and jump for joy. This is how my mother must have felt when she saw the first shaft of sunlight penetrate the fissure in her stone prison walls. I sit up rubbing my wrists. Gracie crouches against the headboard watching me, and I lean forward and wrap her up in a big hug. She smells like apple soap and a little like sweat. Her skin is hot, and I can't think of how nervous she must have been sneaking up to my room. I'm surprised by how thin and fragile she feels trembling ever so slightly in my arms. But she's not fragile not by a long shot. Gracie is strong I realize perhaps stronger than any of us. 
it occurs to me that for a long time she has been doing her own version of resisting, and the fact that she is a born resistor makes me smile into her hair. She'll be okay. She'll be more than okay. I pull away just a little bit so I can whisper in her ear. Is Uncle William still out there? Gracie nods, then places both hands under the side of her head, indicating that William is sleeping. I lean forward again. Are there regulators in the house? Gracie nods again, holding up two fingers, and my stomach sinks. Not just one regulator, two of them. I stand up testing my legs, which are cramping from being immobilized for almost two full days. I tiptoe to the window and open the blinds as quietly as possible conscious of Uncle William slumbering only ten feet away from me. The sky outside is a rich dark purple, the color of eggplant, and the street is draped with shadows as though it has been covered over with velvet. Everything is totally still, totally silent, but at the horizon is just the faintest blush, a gradual lightning, dawn isn't far off. I ease open the window carefully feeling a sudden desire to smell the ocean. There it is, the smell of salt spray and mist, a smell mixed in my mind with the idea of constant revolution, an eternal tide. I feel overwhelmingly sad then. I know there's no way to find Alex in the middle of this enormous sprawling, sleeping city and no way for me to reach the border on my own. My best bet is to try and make it down to the cliffs to the ocean to walk into the water until it closes over my head. I wonder if it will hurt. I wonder if Alex will be thinking of me. Somewhere deeper in the city a motor is running, a distant, earthy growl, like an animal panting. In a few hours the bright blush of morning will push through all that darkness, and shapes will reassert themselves and people will wake up and yawn and brew coffee and get ready for work, everything the same as usual. Life will go on. Something aches at the very core of me, something ancient and deep and stronger than words, the filament that joins each of us to the root of existence, that ancient thing unfurling and resisting and grappling desperately for a foothold, a way to stay here, breathe, keep going. But I will it away. I will it to curl up again to let go. I'd rather die my way than live yours. The motor is getting louder now, approaching. And now I see a solitary motorcycle, a dark black speck coming up the street. For a second I pause fascinated. I've only seen a working motorcycle twice before, and despite everything it strikes me as beautiful, the way it weaves up the street, barely glinting, cutting through the dark, like the sleek black head of an otter through the water. And the rider too, just a dark shape massed on the back of the bike like liquid, like shadow bent forward, just the crown of the head visible drawing ever closer, taking on shape and detail. The crown of the head, like the color of leaves in autumn, burning, burning. Alex. I can't help it, I let out a little cry of excitement. Outside the bedroom door, there's a thumping sound, like something banging against the wall. I hear Uncle William mutter, shit. Alex pulls into the narrow alley that separates our property a strip of grass really a single, anemic tree, and a waist-high chain-link fence from the next. I wave at him frantically. He cuts the engine of the motorcycle turning his face upward, toward the house. It's still very dark, so I'm not sure he can see me. I risk calling his name softly, into the yard. Alex. He swivels his head toward my voice, a grin splitting his face, spreading his arms as though to say, you knew I would come, didn't you? It reminds me of how he looked the first time I ever saw him on the balcony in the labs, all twinkle and flash, like a star winking through the darkness just for me. And in that second I'm so filled with love it's as though my body transforms into a single blazing beam of light, shooting up up up, beyond the room and walls and city as though everything has dropped away behind us and Alex and I are alone in the air and totally free. Then the door to my bedroom flies open and William starts yelling. Suddenly the house is noise and light, footsteps and shouting. Uncle William is just standing in the doorway shouting for Carol and it's like in one of those scary movies when a sleeping beast is woken, except now the house is the beast. Feet pound up the stairs the regulators, I think and at the end of the hall Carol flies out of her bedroom her nightgown flapping behind her like a cape, mouth twisted open into one long, indecipherable shout. I shove against the screen as hard as I can, but it's stuck. Below me Alex is screaming something too, but I can't make it out over the motorcycle engine, roaring to life again. Stop her. Carol is yelling and William comes to life, unfreezing, lunging into the room. Pain burns my shoulder as I shove against the screen again, feel it strain outward for a second, and then resist. No time, no time, no time. Any second now William will grab me, and it will all be over. Then Gracie yells, wait. Everyone freezes just for a second. It is the first and only time Gracie has ever spoken aloud to them. William trips over himself and stares at his granddaughter, slack-jawed. Carol freezes in the doorway, and behind her, Jenny rubs her eyes as though convinced she is dreaming. Even the regulators, both of them, pause at the top of the stairs. That second is all I need. I give another shove and the screen shudders and pops outward, clattering onto the street. And before I can think about what I'm doing or the two-story drop to the street below, I'm swinging out of the window and letting go, the air sweeping me up like an embrace so for a moment my heart sings again, and I think I'm flying. 
then I'm hitting the ground with such force that my legs give way and the air gets knocked out of me in a rush. My left ankle twists and wrenching pain goes through my whole body. I skid forward on my hands and knees, rolling against the fence. Above me the shouting has started up again and a moment later the front door of the house bursts open and two men spill out onto the porch. Lena. That's Alex's voice. I look up. He's leaning over the chain link fence, extending his hand. I fling one arm upward and he grabs me by the elbow, half dragging me over the fence. A bit of it catches on my tank top, tearing the fabric, nicking my skin. There's no time to be scared. On the porch there is an explosion of static. One regulator is shouting into his walkie-talkie. The other one is loading a gun. Strangely, in the middle of all the chaos, I have the stupidest thought. I didn't know that regulators were allowed to carry guns. Come on. Alex yells. I scrabble onto the motorcycle behind him, wrapping my arms tightly around his waist. The first bullet ricochets off the fence directly to our right. The second one pings off the sidewalk. Go. I scream, and Alex guns it just as a third bullet whips by us, so close I can feel the air vibrating in its wake. We jet forward to the end of the alley. Alex cuts the wheel hard to the right, so we spin out onto the street, tipping over so far my hair grazes the pavement. My stomach does a huge somersault and I think, it's over. But miraculously the motorcycle rights itself and then we're speeding forward down the dark street, while the sounds of shouting and the explosions of gunfire recede behind us. The quiet doesn't last though. As we turn onto Congress, I hear the wail of sirens growing louder and louder, a scream. I want to tell Alex to go faster, but my heart is pounding so hard I can't speak the words. Besides, my voice would only be lost in the furious whipping of the wind around us, and I know he's going as fast as he can. The buildings on either side of us are a blur, gray and shapeless like a mass of melted metal. Never has the city looked so foreign to me, so awful and deformed. The sirens are so loud that the noise is like a thin blade, vibrating furiously through me. Lights begin to flicker on in the buildings around us as people are roused from sleep. The horizon is touched with red, the sun is rising, a rusty color, the color of old blood, and I'm so filled with fear it is an agony, a shredding feeling worse than any nightmare I've ever had. Then out of nowhere, two squad cars materialize at the end of the street, blocking our progress. Regulators and police dozens of them, all heads and arms and screaming mouths pour out onto the street. Voices boom amplified, distorted through radios and bullhorns. Freeze. Freeze. Freeze, or we shoot. Hold on. Alex yells, and I can feel his muscles tensing underneath me. At the last second he jerks the bars to the left, and we skid sideways into another narrow alley, clipping the brick wall. I scream as my right leg gets crushed against the wall. Skin grates off my shin as we slide for several seconds along the exterior of the building before Alex once again gets control of the bike, and we shoot forward. As soon as we burst out the other end of the alley there are two more patrol cars swerving behind us. We're going so fast my arms are shaking as I try to hold on and right then I have a momentary flash of calm and clarity and I realize that we'll never make it. Both of us will die today, gunned down or smashed up or exploded in some terrible moment of fire and twisted metal, and when they go to bury us we'll be so melted together and entwined they won't be able to separate the bodies. Pieces of him will go with me, and pieces of me will go with him. Weirdly, the god doesn't even upset me. I'm almost ready to give in and give up, ready to draw my last breath while pressed up to his back feeling his ribs and lungs and chest move with mine for the last time. But Alex obviously isn't ready to give up. He cuts down the narrowest alley he can find and two of the cars following us come to a skidding halt, smashing each other as they try to follow and blocking the entrance so the other cars are forced to stop as well. Horns blare. The sharp stink of smoke and burning rubber makes my eyes water for a second, but then we're out again, bursting forward onto Franklin Arterial. More sirens now, from a distance, reinforcements are on their way but the cove appears ahead of us unfolding calm and flat and gray, like glass or metal. The sky smolders at its edges, a growing fire of pinks and yellows. Alex turns onto marginal way and my teeth clatter together as we bump over the old pitted pavement, my stomach yo-yoing every time we jolt over another pothole. We're getting close. The sirens whine louder, like a drove of hornets. If we can just get to the border before more squad cars arrive. If we can somehow make it past the guards, if we can scale the fence. Then, like an enormous insect taking flight, a helicopter wings up ahead of us, lights zigzagging along the darkened road, the whirring of its propeller deafening, beating the air to waves to shreds. A voice cannons out, I order you, in the name of the government of the United States of America to freeze and surrender. Tufts of long sun-bleached grass appear on our right, we've made it to the cove. Alex yanks the bike off the road and onto the grass and we go, half-gunning, half-sliding, down into the marshes, cutting a diagonal toward the border. 
Mud splatters up into my mouth and eyes, choking me, and I cough into Alex's back, feeling him heave against me. The sun is a half circle now, like an eyelid partially opened. Tuki's bridge looms to our right, black skeletal in the half darkness. Ahead of us, the lights in the guard huts are still illuminated. Even from this distance they look so peaceful, just like hanging paper lanterns like something fragile and easily dismantled. Beyond them are the fence. The fringe of trees. Safety. So close. If we only had time. Time. Something pops. An explosion in the darkness. The mud jumps upward in an arc. They're shooting again, from the helicopter. Freeze, dismount, and put your hands on your head. The patrol cars have arrived on the road that encircles the cove. More and more cars screech to a halt and police begin to pour down the grass toward the marshland hundreds of them, more than I've ever seen at one time, dark and inhuman looking like a swarm of cockroaches. We're up again now, in the short strip of grass that separates the water from the old torn-up road, and the guard huts weaving around a tangle of bushes so quickly the branches sting as they slap against my skin. And then just like that, Alex stops. I slam up against him, biting down hard on my tongue, taste blood in my mouth. Above us the light from the helicopter wavers a little trying to locate us, then fixes us in its beam. Alex raises his arms above his head and climbs off the motorcycle turning to face me. In the solid white light his expression is unreadable, as though he's been transformed in that second to stone. What are you doing? I scream over the noise of the propellers and the shouting and the sirens and beneath it all the constant, everlasting groaning of the water as the tide slurps back into the cove always there always sweeping everything away, wearing everything to dust. We can still make it. Listen to me. He doesn't seem to be shouting, but somehow I can still hear him. It's like he's speaking directly into my ear even though he's still standing there arms raised. When I tell you to go you're going to go. You've got to drive this thing, okay? What? I can't. Citizen 914 238 619 3216. Dismount and put your hands above your head. If you do not dismount immediately, we will be forced to shoot. Lena. The way he says my name makes me shut up. They've electrified the fence. It's powered on. How do you know? Just listen to me. Desperation and terror creep into Alex's voice. When I say go, you drive. And when I say jump, you jump. You'll be able to get over the fence, but you'll have 30 seconds before the power comes back online a minute tops. You have to climb as fast as you can. And then you run, okay. My whole body goes ice cold. Me. What about you? Alex's expression doesn't change. I'll be right behind you, he says. We're giving you 10 seconds. 9. 8. Alex's icy fingers are reaching up from my stomach. Alex smiles for just one second the briefest flicker of a smile, like we're already safe, like he's leaning in to brush my hair from my eyes or kiss my cheek. I promise I'll be right behind you. His expression hardens again. But you have to swear you won't look back. Not even for a second. Okay. 6. 5. Alex, I can't. Swear, Lena. 3. 2. Okay, I say, almost choking on the word. Tears are blurring my vision. No chance. We have no chance. I swear. 1. At that second explosion start lighting up around us bursts of sound and fire. At the same time Alex screams go. And I lean forward and twist the throttle like I saw him do. I feel his arms wrap around me at the last second, so strong they might have carried me off the bike if I weren't gripping the handlebars so tightly. More gunfire. Alex cries out and releases one arm from around my chest. I look back and see him cradling his right arm. We bump up onto the old road, and there is a line of guards waiting to greet us, rifles pointed. They're all screaming, but I can't even hear them, all I can hear is the rushing, rushing of the wind, and the hum of electricity coursing through the fence just like Alex said. All I can see are the trees in the wilds, just turning green in the morning light, all those broad flat leaves like hands reaching for us. The guards are so close now I can see individual faces, make out individual expressions, yellow teeth on one, a large wart on the nose of another. But still I don't stop. We plunge through them on our bike and they scatter, fall back and jump apart so they don't get mowed down. The fence looms above us 15 feet, 10 feet, 5 feet. I think, we're going to die. Then Alex's voice clear and forceful and, incredibly, calm, so I'm not sure if I hear him or only imagine him speaking the words into my ear. Jump. Now. With me. I let go of the handlebars and roll to one side as the bike skids forward into the fence. Pain goes through every single part of my body my bone is being ripped from my muscle my muscle is being ripped from my skin as I tumble across jagged rocks, spitting up dust coughing, struggling to breathe. For a whole second the world goes black. Then everything is color and explosion and fire. 
The bike hits the fence and a tremendous, rolling boom echoes through the air. Fire shoots into the air, enormous tongues looking up toward the ever-lightening sky. For a moment, the fence gives a high, shrill whine, and then goes dead again silent. No doubt the surge shorted it momentarily. This is my chance to climb, just like Alex said. Somehow I find the strength to drag myself to the fence on my hands and knees, dry heaving, vomiting dust. I hear shouting behind me, but it all sounds distant, like underwater noise. I limp to the fence and haul myself upward, inch by inch. I'm going as fast as I can but it feels like I'm crawling, barely making progress. Alex must be behind me because I hear him shouting, Go, Lena. Go. I focus on his voice, it's the only thing that keeps me going up. Somehow miraculously I reach the top of the fence, and then I step over the loops of barbed wire like Alex taught me, and then I tip over the other side and let myself drop 20 feet to the ground, hitting the grass hard, half unconscious now and incapable of feeling any more pain. Just a few more feet, and I'll be sucked into the wilds. I'll be beyond its impenetrable shield of interlocking trees and growth and shade. I wait for Alex to hit next. But he doesn't. That's when I do the thing I swore I wouldn't do. Suddenly all my strength is back fueled by panic. I scramble to my feet as the fence begins to hum again. And I look back. Alex is still standing on the other side of the fence beyond a flickering wall of smoke and fire. He hasn't moved a single inch since we both jumped off the bike, hasn't tried to. Strangely, in that moment I think back to what I answered all those months ago, at my first evaluation when I was asked about Romeo and Juliet and could only think to say beautiful. I'd wanted to explain. I'd wanted to say something about sacrifice. Alex's t-shirt is red, and for a second I think it's a trick of the light, but then I realize he's drenched soaked in blood, blood seeping across his chest, like the stain seeping up the sky, bringing another day to the world. Behind him is that insect army of men, all of them running toward him at once guns drawn. The guards are coming too, reaching for him from both sides as though they are going to tear him apart straight down the middle. The helicopter has him fixed in its spotlight. He is standing white and still and frozen in its beam, and I don't think I have ever in my life seen anything more beautiful than him. He is looking at me through the smoke, across the fence. He never takes his eyes off me. His hair is a crown of leaves of thorns of flames. His eyes are blazing with light, more light than all the lights in every city in the whole world, more light than we could ever invent if we had 10,000 billion years. And then he opens his mouth, and his mouth forms one last word. The word is run. After that the insect men fall on him. He is taken up by all their snapping, ravaging arms and mouths like an animal being set upon by vultures and folded in all their darkness. I run for I don't know how long. Hours, maybe, or days. Alex told me to run. And so I run. You have to understand. I am no one special. I am just a single girl. I am five feet two inches tall and I am in between in every way. But I have a secret. You can build walls all the way to the sky and I will find a way to fly above them. You can try to pin me down with a hundred thousand arms, but I will find a way to resist. And there are many of us out there, more than you think. People who refuse to stop believing. People who refuse to come to earth. People who love in a world without walls, people who love into hate, into refusal, against hope, and without fear. I love you. Remember. They cannot take it.